My guest is Jennifer Michelle of Michelle Marketing Strategies and Greentown Consulting, which you can find online at greentownconsulting.com. Jennifer founded Greentown Consulting because she saw that many town officials want to support native plants and pollinators, but didn't know where to start. So Jennifer adapted the process she uses as president of Michelle Marketing Strategies to help them make the transition. Her process is designed to keep projects on track and facilitate communications. In addition to running these two businesses, Jennifer is on her town's Zoning Board of Appeals and is treasurer of Healthy Corinth. She was also the president of her homeowners association before moving to New York. Earlier in her career, she received an MPH in epidemiology and parasitology from Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She has worked on USAID funded healthcare projects in Washington, D.C. and the Dominican Republic. She also served as an EMT with her local rescue for over three years. Jennifer, how are you doing today? Good. So fun to be here. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for being here. Jennifer, you've had you have valuable information to share with us on how citizens and residents can work with their city officials and homeowners associations to install and maintain native plant gardens for pollinators. Why don't you share with us how you developed a passion for this work? Tell us your story. Well, it's such a funny thing. I actually first got into native plants way back um, in the 90s when I had my first home and I wanted to put all these native plants and I just started learning about it. And I wasn't good at gardening and I lived on my own and I didn't know how to maintain a yard and I worked with the landscaper to put in all these native plants and then I immediately got overwhelmed and watched them all die. And it was a fiasco and we wound up putting a lot of sod back and I swore I would never garden again. And I didn't think I would. And then a couple of years ago, we started keeping a container garden on our little tiny deck because we had moved, you know, that you know, that was so long ago. And I started liking plants. And then we got a house with a yard again and I started getting back into native plants. And now it's just gone crazy in me. So I've been slowly converting my lawn to native plant gardens. And I wanted to get more and more into it because it's, it's so like if you see this whole shelf is just all about it. And um what happened was, you know, I'm a new gardener, so I can't really contribute with that. And I love the insects and the biology, but I can't educate on that. What I'm really good at is project management. And what I'm really good at is marketing and communications. And that is what I do in my, you know, what's been my main job for a number of years now, which is marketing. And it's really not just marketing. I'm a consultant. So I walk, you know, organizations through difficult processes and projects and help keep them on track to get them where they're going. And I thought that is what I see my local town needs. That's where they get lost. They understand it. They all support pollinators. They just don't know what to do about it. And even if you give them an idea, they don't, they don't go from there. They think, well, we could put out a couple of, you know, coneflower and we're done. And that's really not the way to think of it. And I thought that's where I can help. So last April, I put, um, plans in motion and I came up with a system to help towns go from, we're barely even thinking about native plants to actually moving to a very pollinator friendly community and what the steps would be for that. So that's how I created Greentown. Uh, great to hear. Uh, I have a similar story in that my first native plant garden utterly failed. <laughs> and uh, this year it has been a smashing success. Yeah, great. And that's a whole other conversation. But um, why don't you share with us the slide presentation that you brought? Sure, let me um, get that going. Here we go. So the main thing I'd like to get people to do when I talk to them about advocating for their community is to get them thinking like a town or an HOA. And if you really look at all the native plant information out there, all the pollinator information, it's geared towards homeowners. It's about what you can do in your own property, but you have to think differently for a town. So that's where I get started. And one of the things I first started thinking about is helping people understand 
the the way native plants impact a municipality or an HOA and when they use less water. Now, in these slides, I'm comparing it to grass. I'm not comparing it to some other plant that might be in the vicinity. I'm saying compared to grass, which as we know, in a town, that's going to be all over your sidewalks. It's going to be surrounding your office buildings. It's going to be surrounding your government buildings. That's the main that to me is what we're up against is lawn. So it's wonderful to realize native plants use less water. Towns have to pay for water and they have, you know, big water bills. And in a lot of towns across the country, they are suffering from drought. So that's a major issue for them. But it's also mowing. Think about your Department of Public Works in a town. They are, and this is true for HOAs as well, there's a lot of mowing, which means they're not only doing the upkeep, but there's a lot of fuel. And anyone who's been paying attention knows that fuel prices are not good right now. So that's a lot of money for towns that are not making more money. They have a very finite budget. So you have to start thinking about what this means in their world. Um, also, a lot of towns still spray. They spray to make that perfect green carpet, and they're paying for that. So that's another thing that native plants reduce. It also reduces groundwater contamination. And the thing that that relates to for a town particularly is stormwater runoff. The more pavement you have, the more water, when there's a rainstorm, kind of runs into the sewer system, which can overload it, and it can also eventually buckle the roads, which are more cost then. So native plants can help drain that better, provide that drainage to keep that from happening, which is a benefit to any municipality. It can also, for those same reasons, reduce soil erosion, which can cause a lot of problems, especially if you're having a dry area. And one thing people don't realize is that native plants, even if they're not trees, act as a very good carbon sink. That grasslands, you know, prairies themselves are a very good carbon sink, and it is much quicker to get them to their full height and their full size. So that can be very beneficial for towns. But I also like to think in terms of some of the um, the more fun stuff, which is just if you want to have a community gathering, people need shade and native plants can provide that. Now, here's an example of a big tree that's a native plant, but you can also make arbors and put native vines on them and get shade in that way. So they can be used to create a community gathering area, which is very important for municipalities as well as HOAs. So, so then I go, okay, that kind of orients with why it might be beneficial, but what can they actually do? And this is where um, where the town officials, the HOA officials often get lost and people don't know really where to go with them. So what I start out first is by telling people, you know, I, I know we've all been trained to think pollinator gardens because again, as a homeowner, that's that's what we're doing, right? We're thinking I can plant this, I can plant that. But when you're in charge of a community, that's that's only a little part of it, really. And in fact, in some ways, I don't even think it's the main part. So to think beyond it, I always start with policies. That's the main thing, whether you're an HOA or you're a town, your policies set right, the state. Can I interrupt you for just a minute? If it's not, uh, sorry to interrupt, if it's <laughs> not about pollinator gardens, what what is it? Well, it's about creating a community space that is pollinator friendly. And when you change policies, that's not planting a garden, but it makes it easier for everybody else who wants to plant a garden. So it's thinking like that. Right. It's thinking beyond, because I mean, I've talked to towns where they're so happy they put in a pollinator garden right by the town hall. And that's wonderful. But how does that help the person, you know, two neighborhoods mm -hmm. down who's still part of that town and their neighbors reporting them and the nuisance law is still not in their favor. Right. So that's how you have to think differently. A town's responsibility is bigger than a pollinator garden. It's great if they put them in, but if they put them in without doing the other work, they're missing the boat and they're not really serving in their role. Right. Okay, great. That Thank helps. you. So nuisance laws are really just one of them. I mean, we hear it all the time. I've actually been to Wild Ones presentations where they teach people how to go and counter when a neighbor reports them and that they've broken some nuisance law, some weed control law. And it's a problem. I mean, in my first law, lawn when it was falling apart, the neighbors were not happy. And it's 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 crazy making. You know, you it makes you feel very exposed if your neighbors are not liking your lawn and not all neighbors are nice about it. But if you have the law backing you up, that's a very different situation. So that's the first thing I would have towns do is set up an ordinance to help um, promote pollinators. But even beyond that, just to set up their definitions so that um, what is considered a weed is defined and maybe a native plant is defined separately and is a protected status or a pollinator garden is protected. So there are things that they can do with policies that help with that. So um, you're on mute hard, I'm sorry. 
Hart, you're on mute. But Jennifer, we know they're weeds. Look at the name, <laughs> Joe Pie Weed, Milkweed, Ironweed. Yes, but legally, weed doesn't mean anything. It's how you define it and how you define it on the books. So that's one of the main things I try and work with towns to do is look at their definitions and look at um, what they have in those policies because that sets the stage for everything. And it then protects the people in their homes as well, but it also sets the stage for all the different things going on in that municipality. So, um, The other things they can do is they can start setting standards and requirements for public spaces. So it's within their power. Now, I always like to be careful here because I'm not a lawyer and different um, localities are working under different laws because they have to deal with not only their local law, like a village law, might also have to deal with a town law or a county law as well as a state law and the federal law. So there are layers of laws that they're navigating, but where possible, I always encourage towns, take this information you know, to your attorney, and they always have an attorney on staff, you know, or at least on standby, to review it and see, is this feasible in your area? But they can make requirements that sidewalk strips can be either allowed to have pollinator gardens, or they can require that. They can say, no, the standard is now it has to be native plants. There's no reason they can't do that. It's just not habit. But there's that's within their, their capabilities. Um, the same thing is they can require native plantings in public spaces. Now, in this one, we could say here that the trees perhaps are native. I don't actually know where this picture was taken, but the trees might be, but there's a lot of grass. But they can set up law, laws saying 70% native plantings in any, any public space. Now, this is a big thing. There are solar farms and wind projects going on all over the country right now. And there's a lot of effort. I know in my state right now, I'm in New York, there's a ton of effort being pushed to make um, things as much environmentally friendly as possible. Well, these are possible then to make into pollinator friendly areas. So when you're doing a solar or wind project, there's a big open space there. You can plant native plants around there. And more importantly, you can also monitor that invasives don't take over because whenever you disturb an area, that's a risk, right? So having that be worked into their, their laws is a very big possibility. Now, in my town, I tried to work with them on that and they they got nervous and decided that it was too difficult um, to enforce it. They didn't know how. And so we're still working on educating so they would know how to do it. But we did create a guide to go to any solar developers that the town is encouraging that they use that really explains it. And it goes beyond that. The cell towers, I think we've all seen those strips where cell towers are just kind of cut into the landscape. Uh, let me ask you, you're saying that something is difficult. Something about the enforcement is difficult. Is it the plant identification or what? You know, I think it's more of a mental hurdle because to me, it would be easy to say, um, you know, these are the plants that you give them a list, any of these plants, you know, show me a receipt that you bought seed for this plant and planted it, and that would be a way to verify it. I don't think anyone's expecting them to identify every plant there. I mean, even if you plant all native plants, you're going to get a dandelion, you know, it's not, right. <laughs> that's not it. So I think it could be very easy, but I think there's a perception that it isn't easy. Exactly. So that's something that you might come up against if you're advocating to your town and you can talk to them and the workaround in my town was let's make it into a guide. But my town is coming from a very, like they like pollinators, but they're not moving towards that. And they've all been recently elected. So they're trying to clean up you know, whatever was left over from the previous administration and get their feet wet and move forward. And that's something to keep in mind. You know, these elected officials, they are often brand new or they're, you know, they're about to be elected out. It's just a different mindset than when it's your own yard. Mm -hmm. So um, I do like to point out to people that it's not just solar and wind. It can be cell towers, but even landfills you can plant on them. I actually, I think it's, um, I think the document I have on that is from the EPA about things that you can do to kind of help reclaim that. So people might think that that's a lost cause or toxic, and that is not necessarily the case at all. So that's good to know. Um, other things they can do is they can potentially, this is kind of maybe my hill to die on, but <laughs> my goal is what about buffer zones? If they cannot um, forbid pesticide use. And I wish they could, but I don't know that localities necessarily can if the states are still permitting it. Mm -hmm. But maybe they can do buffer zones. Maybe they can do a thing where if you have a registered pollinator garden, then maybe you get certain protections. 
it's um, a dream of mine, that one I don't know if anyone's going to be able to do yet, but I want people to start thinking about it, so I like to advocate for it. Sometimes you have to advocate for things they're not going to do immediately, but for things that they can think about and might be comfortable with two years down the road. Can you give an example of this? Like what would be a buffer zone around a native plant garden? And are, are we who, who, who are the respective property owners here? Well, again, this is more something that I advocate for as an idea just to get people understanding that, um, I don't know if you remember this, but way back in the 70s, when people smoked a lot in indoor spaces, um, that was considered not a problem because you weren't smoking and they got to smoke. And then there was this phase where they did the no smoking section, which meant mm -hmm. it was very, very smoky in the entire room, but the people who didn't like it were at one end of the room. Mm -hmm. So it didn't help. It didn't do any good. Right. But that was a necessary step to get to where we are now, which is just stop smoking around other people. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. So that's kind of where I see this. I want people to start realizing that your neighbor spraying their lawn is not just spraying their lawn. They're also spraying your lawn. And they're spraying all the pollinators you're trying to help go mm -hmm. to their lawn because the pollinators don't read the sign. So I'm trying to get people to understand that and think, okay, maybe if we could make it a designated pollinator garden, maybe there's a way to register that with the town and say, this is an actual space, then maybe within a hundred yards of it or five yards of it or whatever they deem, you can't spray, which would maybe restrict that. I don't know anyone who's doing this yet. I'm just advocating for it personally because I want people to start realizing you don't just spray your own lawn. You're spraying right. what everybody else is doing in the exactly. neighborhood. Exactly, and maybe if some of it is not legally mandated it, there could still be like education awareness yes. etc and yes you know using some sort of communication system within a neighborhood that says i know i can't make you do anything but pretty please please don't do this yeah and that's a wonderful thing now we're talking about what a town can do mm -hmm. so it's going to be more legal but what a neighbor can do is a very different thing a neighbor can invite you over for a barbecue and just start talking native plants and just you know, ask you a favor or make a trade. You know, if you stop spraying, you know, I will loan you my snowmobile or whatever. You know, whatever. I mean, who knows what that might be? But there are different things that you can do. But again, if we're talking about advocating for your town, it's a little different because, you know, that's not your neighbor. But yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can go and just talk with your neighbors, that is always going to be the best approach for, you know, dealing with a specific problem. Absolutely. But this I just see as um, people just not understanding the connection people just have not been taught to think how it connects together you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's not that they're trying to hurt your pollinators they're just not even aware of it right. so they're they're just trying to make it beautiful which i understand that um another thing that towns can do is to make removing invasive plants a priority if you have a specific area where you know invasive plants have become a problem you can advocate for your town to invest in some people to remove that or to maybe even if you and a volunteer team want to remove it maybe they can you know you know invest in the supplies that you would need to do that or loan you some of the supplies so that's something else you can do if that's a particular issue in your area now this is one of the things i love best is there are so many ways towns can educate the community and one of them one of the easiest things they can do is create a substitution list so if they know what the plants are that are mainly used in their area they can create a native plant substitution list so that if you're used to seeing burning bush or bradford pear maybe they can talk to you about you know native rhododendrons and service berry i mean or whatever it is or maybe it's cactus in certain areas um, along those same lines you can also as a town be as a resource and provide people with information on finding native plants because some communities have so many um, local nurseries and others have none, you know? And so how can you tell? And plus you have more and more nurseries where they, um, they either <laughs> don't know anything about native plants or they sell native plants, but they sell native ours and people don't really understand if that's a problem or not. And there's still uh, some- native R. <clears throat> A native R is what? A native bar is a native plant that's been made into a cultivar, so it's a variant. And yeah. the research is still out on um, whether they're helpful or not, because I really think it comes down to the plant. Some plants right. are um, altered in a way that is better for the pollinators, and some are altered in a way that the pollinators aren't interested. I mean, the classic example now is if you make um, a green leaf, a red leaf, like a purpley leaf, the pollinators probably don't like it as much. Though I have one that I got before I knew about native bars, 
and it still gets eaten down to nothing by the end of the summer. So I don't know that who's eating it, but something likes it anyway. But I also have heard different scientists talk about, you know, maybe we could make things more pollinator, you know, friendly. Maybe some of these native plants could become you know, change in a way to create more of what those pollinator needs. That's possible too, could be wonderful. My feeling is if you don't really know, stick with the straight species. And that is easier if you know where to go. So I think giving people resources on, you know, certain websites, um, you know, wild one societies, things like that, native nurseries in their area, that's a great starting point, especially if they're local, you know, let them know who's in their area. So that's a big thing. I also think signage because Anytime you get to show people a little bit of information about pollinator habitat, you not only normalize it, but you help people understand why it's important. So just people, I think people are very surprised to learn that that, um, that relationship like between butterfly, like um, milkweed and monarchs, that's not unusual. You know, we think, oh, well, that's some unusual, crazy relationship that they can only eat that. But that is actually really common that a lot of insects mm -hmm. have a specific native plant. That's what they need. And I start talking to people about, um, you know, adult food versus baby food. You know, you don't feed your newborn infant a steak. You don't. You don't even feed them hummus. You just, you have to <laughs> feed them different things. And it's the same thing for insects. What they eat as an adult is just very different as a baby. And I think people understand that, but they've never thought about it because no one teaches us. So that's a big thing towns can do is give information. And then they can also support campaigns. There's, you know, no reason they can't do the Leave the Leaves or the No Mo May. I know that um, a lot of people now are supporting, I, I just heard a presentation with Heather Holmes and Heather Holm and another one by Doug Ptolemy, and they're both talking now about a campaign for soft landings, which is basically planting at the base of trees, because when the little caterpillars want to drop down, if they mm -hmm. hit like a hard mound of, of mulch or, mm -hmm. or lawn, it's not helpful. They need to have native plants there so that they have the habitat they need to grow. So, but leave the leaves this time of year is great in any area that's going to move from fall to winter. No Mo May has been a big hit. These are things that towns can get behind in HOAs as well. But there are some things that I think can be of special interest to HOAs. It's not that they're not also important to a town, but HOAs are trying to build a very particular community. So one, um, they often are underfunded. So I think saving on lawn maintenance, and this was a huge thing for all the years I was president of my HOA. It's like always trying to find someone who can take care of the yard, always um, trying to figure out how much it's going to cost. It was always a huge expense um, trying to take bids on it. So anytime where you can reduce that is a big help. It's a big help for your HOA. Also, they need community spaces. This is what they're selling, right? It's not just, oh, we all have a condo here. It's This is this beautiful community we're in. And native plants can make a very beautiful place to just hang out. And I think that's another way to sell it to them. And I also like to talk about- This, this particular issue is, is popping into my mind. And that is, you know, people are afraid of insects. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. I think that's more education, but I honestly find that I don't hear about that as much. I hear people focusing on butterflies and I find that when you see a pollinator garden, when it's all in you in bloom or even in the fall, like right now, ours are all turning to seed. But what I mainly find on it are tons of birds. You know, I'd heard that birds would eat the seed out of sunflowers and all this, but I'd never seen it. Mm -hmm. And when I see a little chickadee pulling a little echinacea seed out. I'm just delighted. And right. I find it's like, um, it's as soothing as having a huge aquarium out there, but a lot easier to maintain. So, um, and though and I found our, our neighborhood cat has taken to, <laughs> to sitting right by it. And I'm like, you don't get to right. sit there. Right. Right. Yeah. But that's, that's going to happen sometimes. We'll deal with that. But I think helping people understand, um, one, that, it's not necessarily bad insects to what eats those insects they don't like. What they don't like are things like mosquitoes, number one. Well, who's going to eat them? But bats and birds, those are who are going to eat those. So that's good. They're also worrying about ticks, but ticks, um, I actually read a study about this earlier in the season. Ticks are not really showing up in a random pollinator garden. It's more if you have that, like a big prairie out, you know, against some woods or something. But if you just have a city area with you know, a small pollinator garden, I don't think that's going to be such an increase. Also, people do worry about bees, but that's no different a risk than if you had any flowers. So that's just a risk. 
but I find that the more flowers you have, the less bees pay attention to you because they got things to do. You know, they're not looking for you. So I think some education there, but I don't think you really find that it attracts any more than any garden. It's just a garden. It's just different plants. Mm -hmm. so that, that's how I approach it. Right. Um, I, I think privacy is a big issue with homeowners mm -hmm. associations. Sometimes all you have is like a little kind of a wall or a divider between your area and your neighbor's area. So you can make them very beautiful with native vines if they will permit that. So I think that's something you can talk to your homeowners associations about. But I also think it's important to just talk about how it's a healthier environment. You're not putting as much, um, you know, lawnmower, you know, exhaust fume into their air. You're not spraying it the way some homeowners associations do. You're teaching them something. I mean, most people who have young children want opportunities to go and educate them. You know, they get to learn in a way that is meaningful. So I think there are ways you can sell this idea to a homeowners association that are very pro-community, which is often what, what an HOA wants, and in ways that support the property values, which is the other thing that's always on their mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, big, big. it's a big deal. And there's this assumption that, assumption that native plants uh, are a mess and messes make property values go down. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to solve that. <laughs> well, actually, I, I have a blog post on uh, my Greentown site. Um, so that's greentownconsulting.com. And it talks about how do you make a pollinator garden for people who are skeptical? Mm -hmm. And really, mm -hmm. it's about adapting basic design principles, you know, put mulch around it. I know that's not the best thing you want to have more plants. Put some mulch to visually define it for people. Yeah. Put, um, put bricks around it or rocks mm -hmm. around it or a little fence around it. Something that says this is a real tended garden that we're doing something special here. It's so I, I say it again. It's intentional. I, I like saying, you know, I, I've just been thinking about intentional lately. It's like maybe what people really need to see is that this is intentional and not just a mess. Exactly. Exactly. Because people um, see those symbols and it reassures them, oh, this is a garden. I know what a garden is. Mm -hmm. What they're imagining in their head is usually just an empty lot, which isn't even a prairie. An empty lot is usually something that's been kind of half developed and dug up and it's just got weeds everywhere. And that's what they're imagining when they get scared. And the more we can share images of beautiful gardens, that I think is very different. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's a perception out there, especially because we have an aesthetic in our country that is very, it's not even our country, it's very much worldwide, but right. that is very controlled, very, um, just very shaped and precise and it's not wild at all so that's michael pollen, michael pollen says uh, a lawn is nature under totalitarian control it, it's very it's smart like, that's the important perfect. thing here is that. control there's a it weed is. that way or if something volunteers i didn't plant that there you know exactly the, the only <laughs> thing that can be here is what i planted exactly exactly Exactly. So that's one thing, you know, you just have to, I think at this stage, we have to signal that it's a real, as you say, intentional garden, an intentional space. And that might mean doing things that we wouldn't necessarily necessarily do. Like we might just not do as much mulch, but maybe to be intentional, we'll put a little mulch in so the neighbors can relax. And I think that's a fair trade-off. You know, over time, you can add more layers of plants and still put in that soft landing. But if when you're getting started, like I did a, a little native plant garden with tiny little plugs this big um, by our neighborhood sign because this this we could afford. We could afford a bunch of plants this big. Mm, so right. all they spent the whole season, some grew, you know, a little bit, but mainly what do they do? What does a native plant do? It spends its first year building roots. Mm. So I sent a note out to everybody in my neighborhood mm. and I just said, hey, this is what we're doing. The town's supporting it there. They paid for us to get the plants, but we can only afford little ones. So it's not going to look real flashy this year, but they will grow and just be patient. And I put a bunch of mulch around it so that it looked like a defined space. And everyone's been very excited. Yeah, a, so, a real growth area for me is mm -hmm. to communicate with my neighbors uh, yeah. through signage, through the flyers that you're talking about. Uh, at some point, I would like to look into the possibility of, of having QR codes. Like here's a sign, here's a QR code, and then here's a website that explains what I'm doing. Not as a substitute for the physical signage, but as a supplement. That's really nice. I like that idea. 
So, I mean, we, I do signs and I, um, I also pick my battles, you know, I think sometimes the best way to help with pollinator gardens is not to immediately harangue your neighbor about their spraying, but to get to know your neighbor so they don't think that you're a nuisance yourself, you know, from the very beginning, you know, and some of it you just have to, um, you know, start where people are. We have some neighbors in our um, in our area that are the most lovely people in the world. They are such good gardeners. Their stuff is gorgeous and mm -hmm. it's got a beautiful sense of design, mm -hmm. but none of it is native, right. you know? But you can tell that they know what they're doing and whatever they plant would be beautiful. So I'm just trying to slowly encourage that to move in a different direction. But it's going to be a while. They've been doing it this way for probably 60 years. This is how they garden. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's okay. They're not bad people and they are good gardeners. They just have to have their aesthetic broadened a little bit. Yeah, there are <laughs> native plants that are beautiful by any standards, like purple cone flowers and brown eyed seasons are the, the two that come to mind for me. Just these are gorgeous and these these are ornamental. They have status as an ornamental. They yeah. happen to be native. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I think foxglove beard tongue is another one like that. Um, the columbines are beautiful. Honestly, I think nodding um, onions are so lovely. They are mm. so awesome looking. So I just think they're cool. So and I'm in the Northeast region. So these are the ones in my area. But yeah, uh, talking with your neighbors and educating is always the best thing. But again, if we're talking about a town, we're talking about what can the town do? And so that's kind of what I go to next is how do you get your town aware of it? And I hate to say it, but the number one thing you can do is start showing up at your town council and your HOA meetings because mm -hmm. nobody shows up. And when they do show up, sorry, I'm going to rearrange myself on my chair here. When they do show up, they're usually upset about something. And you can never underestimate how mm -hmm. often the people on these boards are getting yelled at, you know, how mm -hmm. often people are showing up. I mean, um, it's awful. And it's worse for the HOA because they are literally in the neighborhood. So if everybody's upset or if even one person's upset, and there's usually one person who is just always upset, they are knocking on your door and they're yelling at you or they're emailing and they're calling. It's awful. And the same thing happens to the town council meetings. I've been at town council meetings where people simply never show up, never get involved. And then they show up yelling, going, how come this happened? And it's like, well, you never paid attention. You didn't show up at the public hearings. You never read about it. And now you're upset, but it's too late. It was already passed because nobody complained because you weren't here. So just showing up helps you understand what's going on. And then you get to know, like we were talking about building relationships with your neighbors. You can build relationships with your council members and your HOA board. And once they get a sense that you're not there to tell them that everything they're doing is wrong, then they relax a little bit and then you can start talking. And that's what I did. I didn't start out advocating for something in particular because I didn't know what to advocate for. I just started going, could we put native plants in that? Or could we include that? And that's how we got the solar guide created. Is it where I want it to be? No, but is it an amazing first step? Yes. And my response to that was really to be thankful and supportive of what they were doing so that they will be happy to work with me on the next step. So, you know, you got to go and get to know them and see what they're dealing with. And they might not be able to do anything about pollinator gardens right now because like in my town, they just got elected and they had this huge backlog of stuff from the previous administration that had just never gotten dealt with that they had to deal with. So it's it's a tricky thing. And keep in mind, these are usually um, volunteers or they're paid very little to be there and they're often working full time as well. And they also have a family. You have to just understand this is not um, something on their mind and they have a ton of other stuff going on. So you have to find a way to slip your message into that in a way that makes them feel you are on their side, even if you're kind of not, because you need to get them on your side, I guess is how I would say it. And I just think being friendly, being supportive, educating, showing different opportunities to move in the direction of being pollinator friendly, that's how you want to do it. So attending is the number one thing. Now, next, I think, is proposing specific changes. When you um, show up in some of these meetings, you're going to find there is a fall festival that they're planning, or there is um, some change they're going to be making on the local boardwalk or whatever it is. And you can then say, while we're doing that, could we put in a pollinator garden there? Or could we, instead of putting in lawn, could we do this? Or could we put up a sign or something? Then the only way you would know to do that is because you're showing up. 
And because you're showing up, you can make comments that are specific to it. And that's how you can start making a little progress. And again, speaking up, you know, one, they only hear from people who are yelling. And two, they don't really even hear from them that often. What they often get is just no response to anything, unless, um, as I say, somebody's irate. So if you just speak up and educate them, and you can offer to talk to them and say, you know, can I just give you a little bit of information here? Or here's a fact, and that's why I think it's important. And can we consider doing, and then list what you want it to be. So I, I think that's one of the main things. Now, you might not always be able to attend but you can speak up by writing, you can email them, you can just write them an actual letter. And that also counts. Certainly, they're going to pay attention and say, okay, somebody at least wrote this, let's review it. And then you can get your thoughts out there and follow up. And since again, most of the people who write them are angry with them, if you're just writing to give them a suggestion and work with them, it's a very different response that you're likely to get. Another, as I said, I think already, but give a presentation, help educate them a little bit. And I think, um, all of these things you're noticing are little drips. It's like a drip campaign, just a little bit, a little bit at a time. It's not like you're going to show up and immediately they're going to do this amazing pollinator friendly move. That's unlikely to happen unless they've already been you know, made aware of this situation for a while now. So what you're trying to do is build a relationship with them, get to know them, get to understand what the situations are in your community, and then figure out what are the best ways to weave it in. And you might need to go very slowly if your community is nowhere near thinking about pollinators, but that's okay. That still is progress. It's just, it's not as quick as when it's your own yard where you decide, I'm going to put a pollinator garden there and then tomorrow, boom, it's planted. So that's what I'm saying. Thinking as a town and advocating for your town is just a different approach. That's all that it is. Um, if you have local events, maybe you can get a table or maybe they'll let you put some information on their table if the town has um, an event. So there are just little ways you can do it. Writing representatives um, is another one, not just your local, but you can write your state representatives to say, I want this to be a law in our area and can you support it? You can write your federal. Now, it's not like doing that ma magically works. We've been trying to get the Birds and Bees Protection Act passed in New York for years and it keeps failing, even though um, Cornell, which is in New York, keeps saying, we don't need to keep spraying um, neonicotinoids on everything. It's not helping and it's right. hurting. Right. But it it still helps to hear from you, especially in election years. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think about it. Um, I also think this is a, a, one of those beautiful photos that you can share with people. Like this is a native plant garden. It's right. not, you know, it, it is not wild or unattractive. It's beautiful. And even if you look at the ground, I can't really tell what those are. It might just be clover, but it could be, yeah, I don't know what it is. But my lawn, even when it's mowed, is full of native strawberries. So even when mm -hmm. it's mowed and looks like lawn, it isn't. And that is something for help, you know, that helps people to understand it. So that's really what it is. And if people want some resources, I refer them to purplepollinator.com, which is a site I put together with some templates. So if people want to write a business and suggest that they put in a pollinator garden or write their town to say, can you um, support this? It gives templates for them to use and some examples so that they can then adapt that letter and email it off. And then Green Town Consulting, if you think your town wants to move on this and needs a little help, that's what I do is I work with the towns, I work with HOAs as well to help them go through systematically their policies and their approaches so that they can find the best way to become you know, pollinator friendly in their community. And that's all I got for you, Hart. Terrific. Thank you so much. Sure. Here, I'll stop the share. Well, Jennifer, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. So people can find more at purplepollinator.com and greentownconsulting.com. And you are available to speak to people's uh, town councils and homeowners associations. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And that's more through greentownconsulting.com, but always happy to give educational presentations, happy to work with towns if they just need some help with their policies or even setting up marketing campaigns with their town. And, and so at purplepollinator.com and greentownconsulting.com, there's a way for people to contact you on those websites. Absolutely. And I'd be and happy I to talk with them. I encourage our viewers to contact you. It's been delightful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Okay. No, Hart, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. I'm very delighted to talk with all of the people in your community. I think the more of us out there talking about native plants, the better. Sounds great.